Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. I'm good. Good to see you. Okay. Are you okay? I'm doing okay. Yes. I have three questions with you before we start our audience Q&A. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So Vanessa and I have talked a fair amount about this, but I want to ask her out loud and have her sort of explain this to you. So one of the parts of Chris's story that I think is resonating so well with so many readers is that she was just seemingly this regular person, what I call a regular person. There was no magic in her life that allowed her to pursue mountains the way she did. And so you have a very similar trajectory in your career. You kind of started on this career path and came to mountaineering later in life. And so I kind of want you to describe that, like what that's been like being a regular person and how that has played out in your life in mountaineering and kind of what we can learn from that. Okay, perfect. So first, I'd like to thank Jessica for inviting me here to join you. And I just want to say how much I enjoyed Edge of the Map because I have my copy here. And for those that didn't catch my uh, cover quote, I said, equal parts climbing history, um, love story, and riveting mystery. And the reason I said that is because when I was reading it, it was really filling in a lot of the background and detail that I didn't know about uh, at the time. So while it was storytelling, it was also providing, you know, interesting details. So it really was all of those things for me. And I came upon Christine's name when I was debating and researching whether to climb K2. And it started for me around 2014. And I was doing a little Google search. And I put in, you know, kind of K2 and American women, you know, had there been any to climb, Uh, you know, this, you know, horrific mountain, you know, where for every four that climb, one dies. And there it was, you know, um, the 2002 uh, Mountain Madness K2 Expedition. Big press release, um, you know, uh, you know, all this uh, big write up, all this stuff. And I was, you know, captivated uh, 2002. And I thought, okay, well, there it is. It's, it's all there, you know, and I'm reading, reading, reading but so typical of press, um, it left me, you know, wondering what happened, dot, dot, dot. You know, the big announcement, but, you know, nothing following up what happened. So can't find anything else, you know, Googling, 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 nothing about did it succeed, nothing about whether it failed. So I'm going through the K2 list, you know, dot, 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 2002. Ah, okay a year of no summits, that explains it. So I'm thinking to myself, what if Christine had gone in 2003, right? Then she would be the first American woman to summit. So I flipped the page and I looked to 2003, a year of no summits. Now this is just K2 since 1986, when Wanda became the first woman woman to climb K2, there is a 40% chance of any one year having no summits. So the first thing I thought of was good on Christine for not spending two consecutive years, like I did, <laughs> having back-to-back no summits. So that was the first thing I thought. But as I read more and more about her, especially finding that she had led Uh, Nazir Sabir, the first Pakistan man to the summit of Everest, I thought there was something poetic in that it should have been her, right? So that was Mm -hmm. sort of what struck my my mind. Mm -hmm. So when when you say regular people, the other thing that comes to my mind is that I think all mountaineers are really regular people, except if you are talking about, say, indigenous people or people who live at high altitude or Sherpas or somebody like that. Um, All mountaineers are regular people. Uh, They are completely different uh, as as night is as of day, but they really are regular people. Um, I think maybe they have three things in common, and I'm really going off the top of my head, but one would be... um, their, uh, their, their preference 
to seek out um, high risk uh, or high rewards. I, I prefer to talk rewards, but people think about risk, so high risk or, or high rewards, so they're willing to go for that. Uh, the second is uh, their tolerance for um, uh, being in uh, miserable conditions for a longer period of time. I'm not sure all people would want to do that so that they have a, a, a willingness, let's put it that way, a willingness to stay in, in some pretty uh, miserable conditions. Um, that's not for everybody. And probably the third is um, um, ability to go into a state of flow or a high level of concentration and focus. So I'd, I'd say they all do that. Um, as far as other things, um, their, their age, sex, how they got into climbing, what they're good at, what they have to work at, uh, their religion, height, weight, uh, wealth, nationality, uh, sexual preference, religion, all those things are all over the shop, right? They're all, they're all totally different. Mm -hmm. um, Christine and I uh, are similar in many respects. We both grew up in very cold states, Wisconsin for her, um, Michigan for me. Uh, we both had religion in our lives or faith, at least Lutheran for her and Catholic for me. Uh, we both had brothers. She had three um, older brothers and I had one younger brother. So our placement in the family was different. Um, she was probably a baby boomer. Let me call her a baby boomer. She was 10 years older than me. Um, I might have come at the tail end of the baby boomers and into Gen X, so I was uh, subjected more to the 80s music and one hit wonders. So, uh, but we both chose to work for industrial companies, so GE for me and Lockheed for her. And so she was really an engineer and um, I uh, also in manufacturing and, and finance industrial. So we were, uh, I'll call left brain people. And that matters when we come into climbing because we approach climbing very um, uh, factual and, and non-emotive. So she, she comes into climbing, as you mentioned in your presentation, after uh, seeing a presentation on Aconcawa um, uh, that, um, uh, Keith Boskoff was doing, I think at the time. And I come into climbing um, really at the uh, beginning of the subprime mortgage uh, crisis when I'm in Hong Kong, uh, unemployed, looking at the tall buildings, probably inspired and um, looking for something to do. So, but neither of us would have been really uh, put off by something like Everest. Everest would have been a uh, the attitude and approach to it would have been something that we would have just kind of backed into in a logical way. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? We wouldn't yeah. have, we wouldn't, we would have seen um, the path to mountaineering as a simple one. Yeah. Yeah. That's good that you mentioned that whole left brain piece, because I think that's an often overlooked component that a lot of mountaineers share. People focus so much on the athleticism, but that particular piece is so beneficial. I found yeah. It's, it's yeah. definitely there. Yeah.